our sponsors. So um, Agile Denver is a nonprofit organization and they are one of our sponsors. They sponsored our meetup costs, they sponsor our Zoom. And um, you know, we're really glad to be part of their community. Um, we have an Agile Denver board member. Um, would you like to say hello, Lori? Hello, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> that was profound. <laughs> Didn't know whether you wanted to say anything. You want to say anything on behalf of Agile Denver? Um, sure. You know, like I'm super glad to see everybody here. Some familiar faces, some, some not, um, you know, want to thank you for taking time out of your busy days uh, to show up and learn some new things and participate. I know that you have a lot of choices out there. You could be doing one of a million different things, but you chose to be here uh, at this time. So again, thanks. And, and we'll respect that. Um, just want to make sure that you're open to the resources of Agile Denver um, as a umbrella group that has multiple different special interest groups. Um, you can reach them on the website, which um, Marie is going to show you in a minute. And so there's a flavor for everyone. Um, I like to say it's like the fight club of agile clubs because there's something going on every night of the week, pretty much. <laughs> and you can pick and choose and you wrestle over who gets which meetup. Um, so yeah, really just um, take advantage of it. It's all free um, and it's all right now virtual. So anybody can be here um, and great networking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. Um, the, our other, um, our other sponsor is Scrum Alliance. And when we used to be in person, we had a fabulous location to go to and, you know, had a hot meal and, um, it was just really, really cool. So, uh, we're looking forward to trying to get back there. So we're hoping it may be this summer, but we have no promises. So until then we'll be continuing on zoom. Yeah. Um, what else? Okay. So the, so we have an agile Denver North FAQ. And it includes information like what if I'm looking for a job or what if I have a question I want it to ask the general Agile community? Where do I find this meetup recording? How do I get Scrum Alliance SEUs for this meetup? Um, what else does Scrum Alliance offer? What if I want to sign up for a lightning talk, which if you're interested, ping us. Um, and then we also have a section where you have you know, just a bunch of games you want to play with your virtual team. We kind of collect it. So I'm going to stick that link right now into the chat. Um, so instead of talking about all this stuff, you'll just, you can walk away with this. So take the link. Um, where the hell's the chat? Um, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, it looks like I, I want to make sure I'm everybody in the meeting. There we go. Okay. So that's our FAQ and it's, you can edit it. So if you think you have a piece of information that you find very, very valuable, please throw it in there, put a category and put some information in there. So. This is kind of an open doc and we're just looking for resources that people can, you know, jump on. So, and I will um, post the SEU link, the Scrum Alliance SEU link. I'll post that as we get toward the end of the meeting. I'll post it in the chat. The one that's current for March. Yep. I think the one that is in the FAQ may be February. Be February. Yeah. My thinking. Yeah. I don't think I put March in there. I might have, but I can't remember. I can probably change that while we while we talk. That's a brilliant idea, Nancy. See how you are coming up with us, all this smart stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess um, also, I just wanna, right before we um, bring Richard on, um, I just wanna mention, I haven't announced this yet, but it is up on the meetup for March. We have Woody Zill, Zool. Zool. I, I, I screw up names. Hey really bad. Um, but he's going to do a presentation on uh, beyond estimates, estimates and no estimates. So basically, he's going to explore the purpose and use of estimates in the management of software development, and then question some of our typical practices. And um, I'm not going to give any way anything more away. I think you just need to join us. So um, that's going to be March. March, do you want to mention Agile Boulder or not? I know. I, you know, I'll mention it. Um, I don't know for those of you who have been around a while and I, I used to organize the um, Agile Boulder meetup, but I have stepped down and uh, Sherry 
is now, Sherry Sororica is now uh, organizing that. She's taken over. And so feel free to join her out there. I haven't, um, I haven't looked to see what she's got lined up, but usually she gets some, some pretty good topics and speakers. So, so join her out there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess without further ado, we have Richard joining us tonight. We're really looking forward to this, Richard. Um, I was excited because, you know, we don't normally talk about Kanban or, you know, this is just a topic that I think is going to be really, really interesting. So I'm going to allow you, I'm just going to hand it over to you and allow you, you to introduce yourself and take the, take it away. Thanks, Marie. And thanks, Nancy. And thanks, everybody. It's just great to see so many people turning out um, for this meetup. I've been a longtime Agile Denver community member, and I just love to see a thriving community. And it's a great way to connect, given all of our virtual and remoteness. Um, so yeah, thanks. And um, I want to say, if you do have a chance to catch the next meetup, uh, Woody's a pretty cool guy. He's always got something interesting to share. Uh, I haven't uh, seen one of his talks in a while, but I think you'll like it nonetheless. All right. So we posted a, a Miro board link into the Zoom chat. I'm going to use Miro as just a way to step us through this and try to, you know, do a little bit of interaction. Uh, Marie or whoever's host you can give me screen share. I'll also screen share because it doesn't look like everybody's in the mirror board yet. Um, if you're not in the mirror board, fine. If I can screen share, we can follow along. You now Ooh. have the power, Richard. Now I have the power. You have the power. Power. Okay. Let's see here. And Nancy just posted the link again in the chat. All right. Here we go. All right. So yeah, yeah, the you should be able to get into the mural board. I've got everything locked down just so we don't have any little mishaps with the content. Um, but I'll also uh, encourage encourage you guys to engage, and and we'll just talk through this. So for starters, if you guys want to follow me along in the mural board as well kind of zoom you here. So this is, what I'm gonna be talking about is a workshop that uh, I've created and I've been running this for quite a few years now. It's, as I like to say, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Um, and it, what it's about is using the model that's, that's called STATIC, which stands for the Systems Thinking Approach to Implementing Kanban. And I've taken it and, and adapted it a little bit to apply as a, a form of a team chartering type of a workshop, whether we're standing up a new team or we may be taking an existing team and, and reorienting them or, or starting over with them. And so the static model gives us a really good way to start thinking about how we might implement Kanban. And I've got a few twists and a few creative things that I've done that I'm gonna share with you guys. And I also like to point out that I actually use this with teams that are applying Scrum. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that might fit in as well. So I've used this explicitly with teams that are using Scrum. I've used this with teams that are going to try to apply Kanban and a little bit of both. So I'm gonna step you through how I've kind of designed the workshop. We'll talk about some facilitator techniques. It'll essentially be a how-to on how you can try to apply this. Um, before we do, though, I want to do a little quick audience polling here. So I've got a couple of questions I, I want to check in on the group. I've got some dots here. If you're familiar with using uh, Miro, just, you can just grab one of these dots. You can copy, paste, you can duplicate, or you just grab a dot. The first question I have for you is, what do you think is harder? Those of you that have some experience as coaches or scrum masters or whatever your role is, we talked about different roles. How did we come to Agile? Drop a dot, uh, what do you think is harder? Launching a new team or maybe realigning or picking up and starting to work with an existing team? You can just grab a dot, the colors don't matter. I just like colorful dots. <laughs> How come I can't do this? I'm doing a, a left click and a right click. It's been a while since well, I- All you need to do is just with your pointer, uh, if you're, if your cursor is a palm, you're just in pan mode, make sure you've got a pointer. 
And if you just kind of hover over a dot, you can just click on it and then drag it. Or again, you can take somebody else's dot and copy paste. That's not working for me either. It's not working, but a lot of people it is working for it. For, yeah, for a lot of people, I see it. Okay. If you zoom in yourself, just oh the Oh, my bit. God. Yeah, and I, I don't even see my name on there. So. Oh, you know what? I'm on the Zoom link. Hello. I'm not oh. on for it. And I if you're trying to click on the screen share, I can guarantee it will not work. I've done that myself a time or two. <laughs> Love it. Love Sorry. It. Um, that, that, that's, that's exactly what, what I'm doing. Yes, I was so, too. You know, the, the early dots really are telling a story. So it yeah. seems like people have some uh, more challenging experiences. When we start working with existing teams, uh, it can be challenging. And, and I would agree. I, I often ponder the question when I'm, uh, I'm an agile coach. So when I start working with clients, I, I often ponder the question, would I rather take you know, a brand new group of people that know nothing about this. They have no experience. We're starting from scratch. It's Greenfield. Or would I rather take a group that has some experience? And um, I would agree. I'm likely to put my dot on existing teams being a little bit harder because we have to unlearn things. We build in a lot of biases, that sort of thing. Um, so thanks for sharing those thoughts. The second question I I'm curious about um, have you had a team? Are you on a team? Have you seen a team? Maybe switch from Scrum to Kanban. Um, and or have you tried the this hybrid thing called Scrumbon? Again, just drop a dot in any of those quadrants that uh, relate to what you or your teams have done before. So I'm seeing some folks have, have either tried Kanban after trying Scrum, or maybe you just started with Kanban and it's working great for you. Got a couple of dots that say, no way, it's Scrum all day. Maybe you've tried Kanban, but you're finding it's harder, it's not working quite as well. A lot of dots on the Scrumbon. So I put, I put Scrum Bond in quotes and I often use air quotes. Um, I'll tell people, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm so much against whatever this thing is that we call Scrum Bond. I will say in my experience, what happens is we're taking two very good approaches and we're kind of squishing them together. And, and sometimes uh, what, what comes out of that isn't always very pretty. Um, I always like to say we can actually do both in parallel, and, and we should probably be explicit about what we're doing. That helps get everybody aligned and oriented. All right, yeah, so thanks for sharing some of your experiences and insights. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the workshop uh, that, that is essentially designed using static. And I wanna reiterate, what I've done is I've adapted static. Again, it stands for Systems Thinking Approach to Implementing Kanban. I've adapted static for uh, a team chartering type of event. And again, I've run this with teams that are starting from scratch. I've run this with teams that are existing that we're having to kind of realign. I've run this with teams that are using Scrum or any other approach, XP, good old fashioned waterfall, Kanban, et cetera. I like to leverage it because it really amplifies that first principle of Kanban, which is start with what you do or know now. And so whatever we're doing now, we can start with that and we use that and we start building it. The other thing to note is, uh, again, it doesn't matter what method or framework we're ultimately going to use, the model itself really gives us the opportunity to start to discover, discuss, and really explore how things need to work for us as a team. Now, I've got a couple of facilitator tips here, some slides, those of you that may want to try this yourself, um, try to give you some, some insights on, on my experimentation with it. I've been using this a while. I've made plenty of mistakes with it. Uh, somebody asked me at the top of, of the session, you know, do I change it? Have I changed it recently? And I'm always tweaking things. I'm always experimenting. A couple of quick facilitator tips that I've learned is it may be helpful, depending on your audience, um, to differentiate or distinguish between what I call small K 
Kanban, meaning the Kanban system, and then uppercase Kanban, which is the method. And so people sometimes don't really understand the difference to that. And maybe I'm being a little pedantic, but you know, the Kanban system is, is about designing our way of working, right? How do we manage the flow of our work? Again, regardless of, of method, framework, et cetera. But then there's the Kanban method, which is a very specific, albeit simple, but a very specific method that we need to talk about. So I, I'm always careful when I'm facilitating these workshops if people get confused over what I'm talking about, you know, just point that out if you're facilitating that yourself. Um, now, from a structure perspective, I've run this as a two-day workshop, a one-day kind of abbreviated workshop, and I've also run it as a series of micro workshops. It really depends on the situation of the team. So if we have the ability to carve out two full days to, to really dig in, then we can make a lot of progress. But um, as I'm sure many of you, like myself, uh, are experiencing uh, either personally or with, with our teams, right? There's just not a lot of time. It's hard to carve out a full day or two to do this work. So if you can do this um, in flow if you need to. You can do it in small doses if you need to as well. And pardon this slide for all of the text and the small type, but just some additional facilitator tips for you to consider. Um, one thing that I've learned, and you'll see as I continue to go forward, I've, I've tried to set this up for folks so that it's um, easily consumable. Uh, going through some systems thinking type activities can require and involve some deep thinking, and that requires a lot of time, getting in the right space, that sort of thing. So anything that as the facilitator that I can do to make it simple and kind of digestible and really easy for people, um, that's, that's what I try to do. And, and one of the things that I've done is I've essentially taken each of the steps of static and I've written a story format and some acceptance criteria. And we use that just as a way to kind of frame out what we're going to do uh, with the teams. So the static model is actually pretty straightforward. There are a set of steps that we go through. You can see here in, in this frame that I'm sharing. Um, so these are, uh, a version of the actual static step. So it starts with understanding what's called fitness for purpose. Uh, those of you that are familiar with lean and Kanban are probably familiar with the, the idea of fit for purpose. So we start by making sure we're, we have fitness for purpose and we have some activities around uh, uncovering that. Then we talk about how do we analyze demand, right? What are the sources and the characteristics of the demand for our system so, so that we can start to design and model it? We start then talking about how do we understand our capabilities or our capacity to do the work. Um, then step four is we actually start modeling the workflow. Step five is discovering what's called classes of service. And step six in, in static, which I think is the, the key part, is then we start designing our Kanban system. When I first learned about static, what really struck me was how designing the Kanban system happened way down in the order of steps. Um, and I'm guessing many of you have experienced, uh, sometimes when we start with something like Kanban, uh, step one is, well, let's, let's design our Kanban board because that's the first principle of the first practice. And I like that about static because we don't, we don't just jump in and start designing our Kanban system, step one. We go through the process of understanding our system first and then that informs us on how we're going to design our system. So for me, that was the, the real trigger that, that connected with me with the model and how I started to use it. And I found it to be really impactful if we follow those steps. So as I said, what I've done is I've essentially translated this into a form of a team chartering workshop. And so a little bit of an adaptation here. I'm going to step you guys through each of this. And as I'm stepping through it, I'll share with you some facilitator notes. Again, if you choose to try to apply this yourself and also show you some examples of some virtual activities that I do here in the Miro board. Um, and, and we'll talk about what some of those look like as we go. Richard, can I just yeah. ask a question? If people sure. have questions, do you wanna use the chat room? How do you wanna handle that or, or, or stop at a certain point and then ask questions? I'm gonna to try to pause and, and have a, a, a pace here, but by all means, if you want to, if you have a question, if you want to put it in the chat, if somebody can be monitoring that, and by all means, just uh, if, if we need to pause to ask a question, that'd be great. Okay. 
Thanks. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, what I've done, one of the adaptations is I've written essentially a story for each of the steps of static. And I've, I've created that as a way for us to start thinking about how we're going to do this work as a team in the workshop. Um, like any good story, it doesn't really matter so much what I've put into this. What matters is the conversation that, that it enables the team to have. And in fact, I'll encourage a team, if I'm facilitating this, uh, we can rewrite this story if we need to. We can change the acceptance criteria if we need to. Um, as long as they can connect to it and it means something to them, that's what I find to be important. You'll also see I've got some prompting questions here that, that I'll use just to get the conversation started with uh, the team. Now here on the left of each of my story cards, I've got some facilitator guidance as well, uh, some things to think about. Um, at this point, you know, I'm trying to figure out really, am I dealing with, again, a new team? Am I dealing with an existing team? Um, what are some of the things that would really help get them into the mindset of thinking about how they're going to be working together? Certainly, if we're dealing with a brand new team, and this is a true team formation type of a workshop, we'll do some other things. We'll do some icebreaker activities. We'll do some, some typical things to get people kind of comfortable with each other as well, and it starts to give them a sense of that identity. Now, I mentioned adaptations. I'll keep repeating where I have maybe twisted this a little bit or tried to get creative with it. Um, in the static model, when we talk about fitness for purpose, what we're really talking about is our service or product, right? How do we know that the service that we deliver or the product that we create is fit for purpose? Is it fit for the market? Is it fit for the customer? What I tend to focus on more here is as a team, are we fit for purpose and do we understand the service or the product we're being asked to focus on? And so again, it's a little bit of an adaptation of, of the pure static model, but you know, we may typically have activities around you know, mission, vision type statements. Uh, we might be, if we're doing product work, uh, we'll, we'll look at our product vision. If we have one, if we don't have one, we'll create one. If you follow me over to the right, as I'm scrolling down, you'll see I've got some frames of some actual examples of workshop content. And what I also want to point out is as I'm going through this, go all the way over to the right here, you'll see I've got some content that I use virtually. I've also got a space here, a column. I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, so please, as I'm going through this and as you're looking at the different types of activities that, that I do, uh, feel free to create a sticky for anything that you do. I know there's a lot of experience on this call today. Um, so if you've got something that you've done or that you've tried or that you've seen that maybe might resonate with other folks, feel free to grab a sticky and uh, just type it in, share it for folks here. And we'll keep an eye on that. Certainly as we do a wrap up, I'll come through and we'll check to see if anybody's given us some cool ideas to share here. But feel free to add ideas as I'm going through this. Okay. So that's step one, right? We, we're really getting the, the team to get aligned on who they are, what is their purpose? Do they understand why they're being formed as a team? Or again, if they're an existing team, do they really understand the nature of, of the product or the service that they're having uh, to work on? Um, as we talked about on the onset, if we're dealing with an existing team, we may have some things that we're gonna have to uh, start to peel apart and unlearn eventually. Those are some things that might start to come out in this first step. Um, and we start to talk about how the team has been working and making sure that they understand what is the nature of their work. The second story is, is following on in that first step. I split it out uh, for the activity because I think it often gives us space to really talk about uh, specifically what our challenges are, but it's really focused on what we call sources of dissatisfaction. So again, if we're dealing with a brand new team, uh, we may not have a lot of information in terms of what problems we're trying to solve. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a history of retrospectives, but if I'm dealing with an existing team, hopefully the teams have been doing some form of retrospectives, Kaizens, et cetera. They've got some data that we can pull on 
that will talk about, well, how have things been working? What feedback are we getting from our customers? What feedback are we getting from, you know, from others about what's not really working well? If we need to, we can do a lightweight retrospective at this point. Um, I'm a big fan uh, in this particular format of doing like a speedboat or sailboat type of a gamification um, rather than a traditional, you know, what's working well, what's not working well. Again, I know we've got a lot of really good experienced folks on the call, so I'm guessing everybody has a pretty deep tool bag of various uh, retrospective formats or techniques you might use. Um, I'm kind of partial to the, the speedboat metaphor. It can be fun. It can open up some ideas for folks. Again, if we're dealing with a neat team that's newly formed, we may not have any, any context here. We may not have any feedback. Uh, one thing that I tried with a few teams that were newly formed is we actually uh, put it into the backlog for the team, but we had the team go out and talk to stakeholders and users and managers and start to gather some feedback on what do we think are the problems that we're trying to solve? What do we think um, you know, our customers would be saying if we can go talk to, let's say, some customer success people or user experience people? How can we start to get input into what are the problems that we're ultimately going to need to be solving? I'll pause here. Any, any questions or comments? I'm trying to follow along in the uh, chat as well. All right. Hey, so Richard. as we, yeah, go ahead. Simon here. I'm curious at, at this stage of, of the workshop, when you've got all this, the points of dissatisfaction, are you looking at all at trying to discuss or, or figure out what the magnitude of the impacts of that dissatisfaction are or anything like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I often will use that very word if we can put some relative impact to these. Um, there may be a source of dissatisfaction, but it, it may be trivial. It may be something that's, that's simple for us to, to address, or it could be something that's a really big impediment. So at this stage, yes, we may start to identify uh, some sense of impact for these. We can further do that later as we get into a couple of the other steps as we start modeling and mapping these things out. Um, but certainly that's, that's something that would be a good question to ask in my opinion. Looks like we have uh, another question in the chat, Richard. Um, fitness for purpose, how do you encourage the team to explore their competencies to build a service or product? So great question. So this is another part of my own personal adaptation. I've split out and we're gonna get into its story number four. Um, we'll get into talking about actual competencies and skills. And again, this is, uh, and I'll explain why I split that out just in a minute. Okay. okay. All right. So story number three, now we, we're starting to talk about analyzing demand. Um, where is demand coming from? You know, what are the characteristics of that demand? Um, I do find, particularly with scrum teams, this is a, a more interesting question sometimes than, than with teams that have a, a different way of working or have some experience with Lean or Kanban. Um, uh, I occasionally get response from teams that have been applying Scrum, and the, the only answer is, well, from our product owner, of course. Right? All of our demand comes from our product owner, and product owner prioritizes our backlog, and, and we plan our sprints, et cetera. And so this is one area where sometimes scrum teams haven't really taken the time, again, put on their systems thinking caps to probe into really understanding um, the sources and the characteristics of demand. How do things flow into their backlog? What are the various characteristics of that? Um, because it was one of the great things about scrum is it gives us this nice cadence. It gives us all these nice containers uh, to iterate through, et cetera. Um, but it can be valuable still, even with the Scrum team, to start to really explore the aspects and characteristics of their demand. Um, you know, how quickly do things come into our backlog? What, what are the various 
um, uh, levels of impact again on, on how things are going to work. Do we have different types of work? What are the different types of work items that we might be looking at? And this really starts to, to shape how we think about other aspects of designing our Kanban system, as do other elements of, of this model. And again, I'm not going to do too much scrolling back and forth, but if you scroll off to the right, you'll see uh, we've got a couple of uh, examples of some virtual activities that I'll do. Um, and this board uh, will note, uh, this is not the only activity uh, that I do for this particular topic, but I grabbed a board that I had simplified down. <clears throat> but for example, one, one activity we could be doing is doing some uh, stakeholder mapping, understanding who are our stakeholders, what are the characteristics of our stakeholders, and then we start to talk about, um, you know, what do they need, how do they communicate with us, what frequency, et cetera. So that can really set the table to really start to understand our sources of demand as well. Then we get into step four or story four, which is analyzing capacity. So back to the question on fit for purpose, um, if I'm dealing with uh, a new team or even a team that's, that's kind of just realigning, um, I have tried doing this at step one as part of the fit for purpose. What I typically do though, is I split it out, usually because um, this can take a lot of time and it can also take some, some particular facilitation. So I, I found that if we put it up front, it, it can weigh down the group a little bit. So I've split it out and I treat it as capacity. But for me, it, I'm really more focusing on capabilities and skill sets. Uh, so again, a little bit of an adaptation, uh, playing around with the, the true intent of the static model. Um, but here, again, I do like to point out that depending on the context, I might use a couple of different techniques. If we're forming new teams, we might do a market of skills type of an activity. Uh, that could have been done up in the fit pur purpose step, uh, but we might do a market of skills just to get people kind of understanding who's here and, and what do we bring to the table. Um, for teams that are existing or teams that I get a sense or just more you know, down to business. Uh, engineers sometimes don't want to play games. They just want to get down to business. So we may just dive straight in and build a skills matrix. And again, depending on the complexity of the work and the characteristics of the team and the individuals, this particular step might take a while. And it may also require some iteration. Um, but what we're really doing here is, is the way that I run it is really trying to focus on, um, do we have the skills and capabilities and do we have the right people um, to do the work that we need to do? So again, it's, it's really a, a part of the fit for purpose type of an activity, but I've split it out uh, as a separate thing. And I find that, that that tends to yield a pretty good outcome. A couple of uh, things that I like to point out here um, is, there's a, a nice side benefit of doing a skills matrix type of an activity. Um, and the way that I run it is, uh, whether we're doing it in person or virtually, is the team identifies all of the skills and competencies they think they need to be able to do this work. Um, and then each person takes a turn and essentially self-assesses. Now, if we're dealing with an existing team, um, the uh, little twist that I put on it is as the individuals uh, self-assess, then we step back and there's a bit of a, a dialogue with the rest of the team uh, to kind of check our biases and, and give, you know, and, and support each other. Uh, if we're a brand new team, we may not have that history together. So that step might not be necessary. But one of the nice benefits uh, of doing this type of an activity is we can also identify gaps and mentoring opportunities. So one of the things I'll encourage team to do is you know, maybe I'm a novice in a particular area, but I see that you know, Marie is an expert. So I may uh, go to Marie and ask her you know, if she would be willing to mentor me or if we could pair and I can start to learn uh, from her. And that I think is a really strong benefit, uh, a nice side effect, if you will, uh, from a teaming perspective.
story. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is from Nawaz. Um, what, it, what if it's a new product forecasting demands? I think it was from right. the slide, but. So back on analyzing demand, if we're doing greed build new product development, right? We, we don't have any empirical data likely to do very good forecasting. But what we can do is we can use data and empirical evidence through experience of other products that we may have in our portfolio. We can, uh, we hope at this point that we have product owners, product managers that have been doing some level of analysis, some either market research, talking to customers, et cetera. So uh, my, my short response would be gather whatever data we can, um, knowing and acknowledging that, that some of that data may not be um, as useful because we're speculating, we're, we're hypothesizing on a few things. And what we may do is, is if we're gathering a certain amount of data, uh, we're going to acknowledge that uh, any forecast at this juncture is, is probably uh, folly. So we can use that and we can explicitly built into um, our backlog of how can we start to validate some things as we go. So that could be an area, again, from a new product development where we don't have as much data, we're not gonna get as much benefit of, of that activity versus a team, again, that has an existing product or service or a team that has additional data available to them. Yeah, thanks for calling that one out. All right, so step five or, or story five is, is now we start to model the workflow. Um, keep an eye on the clock here, but I'll, I'll make this one short, right? We, we've all done uh, some sort of process mapping. We've all done some workflow mapping, et cetera. Uh, the one thing, the one little anecdote that I always like to share here, because this comes up all the time, is when I introduce this piece, I will often get some eye rolls or people just kind of dismissing it. Um, well, yeah, we, we know how this is going to work. We, we have the workflow. We already understand it. What I always remind people is that if, if most of that knowledge is just up here, then uh, or it's just tribal knowledge, as we like to say, if we haven't really visualized it, if we haven't gotten it out there in the open, uh, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And inevitably, in this activity, once people start actually visualizing, um, the inevitable comment comes up of, well, I, I didn't know that's the way Marie or, or Nancy thought about this stuff because I always do it this way. And so this is a really powerful step to start to create that awareness and alignment and get everybody seeing it and uh, you know, being able to kind of play around with how things flow. Now, again, if we're a scrum team, or if we're intending to use Scrum, I find a lot of Scrum teams really take this part for granted as well, because our workflow is simply, we have an item in our backlog, we prioritize it, we do sprint planning, and we do our sprint. Of course, we pull everything in work in progress during our sprint. And then at the end of our sprint, voila, everything's done. So this is a really important activity to get everybody working together, visualizing these things, because it starts to uncover uh, those of us that know Lean and Kanban, it really starts to uncover where some of the impediments and bottlenecks are in the flow. Um, and again, uh, I'm generalizing, but a lot, of, a lot of teams that are applying Scrum tend to take that for granted. They don't really look at the flow as much um, because, hey, it's, it's, it's a sprint. We do all this work in the sprint, and at the end of the sprint, we're done, and we start our next sprint. So this can be really valuable. Um, and just doing it together as a team uncovers so many opportunities uh, and it covers a lot of really good information. All right, from there we do uh, step six, which is about defining our classes of service. Um, again, not a common uh, topic for teams that are applying Scrum, but those that have been applying Lean and Kanban know very well how to talk about classes of service. Um, and, and this is simply, for me, I really emphasize here, this is how we're gonna prioritize our work. And this is how we're gonna make decisions when things try to disrupt the flow of that work. Um, again, even teams that are applying Scrum uh, may not, this may not be obvious to them, but as they start thinking about things, 
Uh, I'm guessing for most of us, it's not uncommon that we may have uh, new feature development teams that also have to support production, okay? Two obvious different classes of service there. We've got the prioritized features in our backlog that we've talked about with our uh, product owner. And then we have these production support issues that come in on a regular basis uh, that we have to deal with as well. So a lot of times it's implicit in how we work, but this step is really about making it, making it explicit and really making sure that we understand how all of this comes together. Again, you know, pretty straightforward here. I think most of us have a, an inherent understanding of what the various classes of service that we have to face, um, but this really gets us to think about them, document them, get them out there so that we can then get into the next step, which as I said earlier, to me is the, this is where the magic happens. And this is what's so cool about static in my opinion is now that we've done this work, and, and again, whether we've done this work as, as part of a two day or a one day workshop, or maybe we've been doing some small um, iterations of work over, over a period of time. But what we're doing is we're using this systems thinking approach to really gain understanding, to build knowledge, and now that we've done this, now we can start talking about actually designing our Kanban system. And I always encourage teams, you know, don't be a victim of your tools. Um, so a lot of times I'll hear, I'll hear a comment of, well, we, we use JIRA and the JIRA administrators say we can only follow this one configuration or we use some other tool. And, you know, the tool dictates what our Kanban system needs to look like. Um, and you know, that may be a tragic truth, but you know, I always try to encourage teams to be creative here and to really think about, you know, design the system that makes sense for your, you know, your sphere of influence and design it in a way that really speaks to what we've learned by going through this activity. Um, again, here, we, we're probably not gonna get the first iteration perfect. Um, at least I've never seen a perfectly designed Kanban system in the first pass. I encourage teams to experiment and play around with this and get creative. Um, if they can, depending on what tools they're using, if they do have a flexibility to, to be able to reconfigure things, then that's pretty powerful. Um, but here's really where they start to understand um, how things need to work and they can design their system. And this is also pretty impactful for Scrum teams, in my opinion. Um, because they can see that there's more to just saying we have our sprint and we're pulling all this work into a sprint to get it done. They can really understand and start to think about how things flow within that time box. And then lastly, um, something that's added, and this is part of static. So static says, okay, now, now go roll it out and get feedback. Start to socialize your, your Kanban system. Um, and so I encourage that as well. Um, the thing that I've added into this uh, workshop, because again, it is a, a bit of a team chartering, is what we call team priming. So what do we need to be able to go forward and, and succeed? So if we're a brand new team, maybe we're going to have a certain set of needs. Uh, if we're existing team, maybe we have some needs that we're, we're gonna have to fulfill. Maybe we need to go talk to our JIRA administrator and see about getting that configuration changed. Or maybe we need to go look at, uh, talk to some customers and figure out how we're going to, you know, make sure that we understand what our SLAs are, those sorts of things. But this kind of brings it all together at the end of the workshop. And it really sets the expectation of, we're just beginning to understand how, how our system needs to work. And, and this is something, and again, that really launches the team into thinking about taking on a new way of working. So that's, that's the workshop in a nutshell. And I, I did fly through it pretty quickly. And I do wanna also zoom out and reiterate. I've got a couple of examples of, of activities that I've been doing virtually here in the Miro board. And I'd really like to hear from everybody else. I know there's some experience out there. Uh, I don't see any stickies with text in them, but um, feel free to share. If you've tried one of these techniques, if you've used a different type of activity, um, definitely would love to hear it. They're gonna just kind of ver verbally share, right? Or Yeah, if you can drop it in a sticky, that'd be a great artifact for folks, but uh, otherwise, please share. 
Looks like there is one maybe out, out there at the top. It's hard to read, but somebody, I think it looks like somebody put Teen Charter Working Agreements Workshop. Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah. You got an eagle eye there. I know. Right. <laughs> I <had to> zoom out. <laughs> yeah. That was mine. Yeah, again, that's, that's, that, that's a great activity. Um, you know, taking teams through a working agreement is, is always a good starting point. And I noticed Mike put into the chat, uh, also when he was talking in uh, reference to modeling the workflow, that it would infl inform or refresh elements of the team working agreement. Yep, absolutely. Hey, Richard, this is uh, Stephen Archer. Quick question, and I'm not quite sure where this might fit um, in the levels, in the steps there, but I've used the um, Get Kanban game or Feature Bond game before to introduce uh, Kanban to teams through yeah. the experience of it. Would you would you suggest doing that before ever entering into this workshop as a precursor, or would you introduce it somewhere within one of these levels? Um, great question. I've, I'm a big fan of the Get Kanban game. Uh, I've run that uh, as a training technique many, many times. Um, I do want to distinguish this is separate from training. So this is not a training workshop. So typically training, some form of training would have happened before we get here so that the teams have some of that knowledge. Again, if I'm working with a team that intends to apply the, the Kanban method, we would, have, we would have done some form of training and ideally it would include something like the Get Kanban game. If we need to reinforce some of that through this workshop, we can certainly do that. So it's not uncommon that we might inject, uh, you know, uh, either reiterating something that we covered in a workshop or even injecting some gamification. So that would be something that if you had the space to do it, uh, you could certainly introduce the Get Kanban game or any other gamification along the way to help reinforce uh, some of these activities. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, Richard, if I could just add a, a, a similar experience. Mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic, I uh, had a workshop, multi-day workshops uh, that I ran in quite a few times where we did, we played the Get Kanban game and from that went right into a similar kind of workshop, all in a room in person together and the yeah. connecting the Get Kanban game to designing your uh, Kanban system in close time uh, proximity was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I always tried to do just that. So it's not, a, um, typically we might have our workshop and then immediately on the heels of that, um, our training them with me on the heels that we would do this uh, workshop as well. That really kind of drives the sense of urgency and 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 in my experience, it, it gives a much uh, more sticky, much more stickiness to the learning uh, part of it and and it really just teases us tees us right off into doing the work. Richard, this is Kelly. Just a quick question. At, at, at what point do you address the, the planning aspects, the planning steps during this setup uh, and incorporating it? And, and I ask that because teams have had uh, questions, resistance, or adoption of Kanban because of this false belief, belief of uh, lighter planning or no planning. So at what point during the setup, you know, utilizing static, do you uh, sprinkle yeah. that in or address the planning aspect? Um, I, I would start with uh, step three or story three when we're talking about analyzing demand um, because how and, and it would be reinforced when we get into classes of service and then further reinforced when we design the Kanban system. So it, it, it would start here on analyzing demand and then be reinforced as we get deeper using the tool. Um, and I, I, I include an image um, about you know some of the cadences within Kanban and how we use these as opportunities to connect, uh, refine, get feedback loops, et cetera. So planning happens at a lot of different levels as we all know. So I would, I would start here and then again, reinforce that as we go through the additional steps, particularly classes of service 
and then the workflow and designing pieces. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> This is kind of a process question while others are um, thinking about questions. Will there, there be a link to this Miro board so that folks can um, walk away with this presentation? Um, yes, what I can do, um, I typically can create a PDF of this as well, and I can, I can post that out. Um, someone hit me up earlier about uh, if I could create a template out of this Miro board. I have not done that yet. Um, but I might be able to do that and share that out. Um, I do want to make this available to everybody. This was, you know, not certainly not my creation. I'm I'm standing on the work of others, um, and I also want to point you to a couple of references that I have here. Um, about a year and a half ago, I wrote an article, which is kind of a step by step. So the article talks through everything that I shared with you, so you can reference the article on our blog post that, that guides through how the workshop uh, can be facilitated. And then there's references from David Anderson and Mike Burroughs, particularly as I learned about static. Um, but yeah, I will, I will definitely create a PDF of this and I can, I can make that publicly available. And I will look into creating a template for the workshop piece as well. Wow, that's, that's really cool. Thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Back My only the... ask would be if you use it, share your thoughts and experience and provide feedback so that all, all of us can learn from all the cool things that you do with it. Hmm. Yeah, Richard, I need to do this like yesterday. So yeah. <laughs> I would love a template because we could just get started with what you have here. Yeah, great. Richard, you asked for some post-its and uh, I put one up on the... <clears throat> the value uh, statement area from crossing the chasm at the very top. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found useful is to put each of those prompts into its own line. Yeah. And, yeah. and then have people put their post-its uh, with ideas and then use the voting tool in mural or in uh, Miro. <clears throat> Miro. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I've played drive. around with a lot of different formats in Miro for the elevator pitch. Um, uh, this one that I happen to have here is, is the simplest of simple uh, formats for that, but there are definitely uh, a lot of different ways to structure that. Yeah, thanks for that. Richard, early on, you had asked about, you know, <clears throat> the comparison of uh, the challenges of working with a brand new team versus an established team. Is there anything that that you would hesitate with using uh, Kanban and approaching it using static uh, with, a, with a, a team that is just coming together, maybe some uh, experience with agile, but uh, overall, they're, they're very new to as a team as a whole. Uh, new to, you know, most of Agile, um, any hesitation there with, with approaching them with this versus, say, um, introducing Scrum? Yeah, um, not specifically. Um, the, the, the newness or not newness is, I find that to be less of, of a constraint. What I try to determine before I pick a path regardless is um, what's their, again, what's their context? What challenges, uh, you know, have they told me they're facing? Uh, what's my sense of their, their relative level of autonomy and, and quite frankly, discipline? Um, you know, I, I, I've learned um, that, you know, while Kanban is a super simple method, it requires a lot of rigor and discipline. Um, and again, I'm guessing many of you that have tried it have, have experienced that in some form, um, you know, whip limits, for example, right? Second, the second practice, uh, that often gets thrown out the window pretty quickly because it's not easy, right? It, it takes practice and you have to experiment and it's hard. 
and maybe you've got too much pressure in your organization and and you know what are you talking about whip limits you got to get all this work done so it's it's real easy to to uh, throw th things to the side and it's true for scrum as well in my experience you know we can take pieces of scrum away because it's inconvenient but now all of a sudden we've got a pretty shaky framework so it, i try to try to determine uh, a, a host of, of things around culture, around their current you know, level of, of uh, autonomy, uh, how disciplined do I think they can be? Um, I'm a big advocate of actually starting with Kanban and starting and using static to do that, to uncover the, the truth about our system. And then um, if Scrum makes sense, we could, we could quickly move into Scrum I often see the opposite happening in, in the real world. Um, teams dive straight into Scrum. It's a great framework. If we're doing complex work, great, let's do Scrum. Um, I often see teams starting off with Scrum and then for a variety of reasons, they shift to Kanban either because it's easier or, hey, we've, you know, we know what we need to do now. We don't need all this, this you know, so-called framework. Um, but again, they, they may be missing some some other things, right? So um, I, I don't have a hard, firm answer. I'm a strong proponent of Kanban, and and that can be applied as as a standalone method, or it can be applied alongside of anything else, including Scrum. Excellent, thank you. I'm curious. Does does anybody else have have some thoughts for Kelly on that question? I'm guessing others may have had some similar experience. I do have a question myself, Richard. Um, do you recommend having to go through all eight steps? Or is there an opportunity to say, maybe only use some of them, right? Based on where that team is or teams? Um, or yeah, uh, it, to be honest, I, I do encourage going through each of the steps. Mm -hmm. That being said, some steps may be lightweight, right? We may just dip our toe and get enough information and move on to the next step. The other thing to, to note is if you look at the steps of static, I'll zoom in again, they build toward the ultimate goal of designing the Kanban system. So the risk of skipping a step means we're risking the integrity of our Kanban system. So what I would recommend first is, uh, you know, address each step. But if if there's a step that is just lighter weight that that you don't need to go as deep into, okay, maybe you try that. And then because you, you can always iterate back, you can always go back and say, all right, now we've been experimenting with our Kanban system, and we realize we didn't really understand demand well enough. Let's go back in and let's revisit that. So that's how I tend to approach it. Let's, let's follow through the steps. Let's see what we learn. And then hopefully as we design our Kanban system, it will be a, a better reflection of what our real needs are. Thank you for your perspective. I, I, yeah, I really love the mirror board and how you organized it. It makes so much sense in terms of flow um, and interactivity. And, but I'm wondering, have you ever used the static canvas before or heard of the static canvas? I, I want to say yes, but I'm going to say I don't know. Okay. Can you tell me more? All right. Yeah. It's, it's a, I'm sorry. Tell me more. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it's not my canvas. It's one that's been out there for a long, long time that some, you know, advocate using. Obviously, it's not. I mean, some have put it on a mirror board and used <laughs> it and then kind of customized the mirror board a little bit. And some just go straight for the canvas and use that. Yeah. Um, and it's out there. Anybody can find it. But it gives you obviously these the whole breakdown of, like you said, demand, capacity, yeah. figuring out sources of dissatisfaction, going through the cadences. Yeah, the whole flow and then going down to designing your whole Kanban system. So, yeah, I just I was just curious if you had ever used that before, because I have in some of my workshops. So, yeah. I, I, I think I've, I've certainly seen it. I, I can't say that I've actually put it to use though. So I'll, I'll go take a look at it. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Hi, Richard. Kind of building off what Taz was saying. Um, this is great, by the way. Um, with, with teams that have been kind of in existence for a long time, what would you suggest? It, 
do you, have you used this in a pattern of kind of revisiting on a regular basis or how would you go about kind of reinvigorating static, yeah. if you will? Yeah. So I've used this specifically when we, we know there's a need to, to realign the team. Um, I, you know, that's, this is a, this is a fairly rigorous activity. Um, uh, and, and it requires space for people to really get into some, some good deep thinking and to iterate through that. So I've particularly used this with teams that we know we need to get some realignment or have gone through something. Maybe they need to reform because the, the team is now being reconstituted, what have you. Um, or they've been practicing for a while and it's just not working and, and they're on the brink. Uh, for teams that just might need, quote, a, a mild refresher, um, uh, I think to the, to the question earlier of, could we take a few of these activities and introduce these to the team and help refresh or refine uh, the team? Uh, we certainly could. Um, and so I could see taking a, a, a diff slightly different version of this workshop for not, not necessarily realigning or resetting a team, but maybe as a refresher. Um, again, the each of the steps leading up to step six of actually designing the Kanban system can ostensibly be standalone, um, uh, you know, systems thinking type activities. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Richard, looks like we have a question. Now, Waz, would you change anything if we need to scale it to a portfolio level? Ah, uh, uh, the scaling question. Um, I, I am sure that we would need to change something. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling because this question was asked to me this week. Um, there's an, uh, another, another group, another meetup uh, that is a, essentially a scaling meetup and they were curious about this topic. And so they challenged me to think about how I would present this in the context of scaling and portfolio. Um, so, the honest answer is I've not done that yet, but that's on my to-do list uh, as of a couple of days ago. Um, and so I, I, I can try to do this kind of out in the open and publicly, and I would love feedback from folks if you have ideas on, on what might work there. But um, yeah, I'm gonna dig into it. And I'm gonna see what, what this would look like if we were talking about doing it at scale. I, I'm not sure that it would be Part of me says it wouldn't be significantly different, but I'm I'm also not naive. I'm sure it would be, it's gonna be different in some form. So I'm gonna dig into that here in the near future. So uh, stay tuned. Kim, I think you had a question, right? Yeah, um, I was just trying to find a way to jump in. Um, yeah, Richard, I was curious about um, for teams where there could be lacking psychological safety or the other, another factor of just having some power imbalances, curious whether you would do something else first and then come to this or modify this approach right. to help take that into consideration. Um. Well, I absolutely take it into consideration. Um, as I was responding, I think to Kelly earlier, you know, before recommending this workshop and certainly before facilitating this workshop, there's a lot of work that goes into understanding the context and understanding who I'm working with. Um, the, um, I, if there's a clear need for some specific uh, pre-work, around psychological safety, we might do that. Um, we may also try to address it in flow. Um, I, I certainly, as I'm taking teams through this activity, all sorts of things start to bubble up. Uh, you know, teams, individuals will start to express, you know, well, well, we're not empowered to do this, or it doesn't matter what we say here because et cetera, et cetera. So as these things are emerging, um, you know, I try to be really careful with, with how we deal with these things. Um, sometimes we can, we can embrace it and we can say, well, let's, again, this is part of this process. Let's, let's talk about how this affects our system. 
or we may need to put things on, you know, in the parking lot and come back to those later. So I'm absolutely mindful of it. I may occasionally, if I have the right insights, do some other things before getting to this point, uh, other than the training, as we've talked about, um, and or things may emerge out of this that will give us opportunities then to go address those types of topics. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, it, yeah, of course you do due diligence before you um, jump in and, and you can maybe address things ahead of time. Um, my second part to the question was, do you, if things are uh, unfolding as you are going through these seven steps, um, what I'm hearing you say is you just deal with them as they go versus I'm modifying a step to accommodate you know, finding that this activity or that activity could be more helpful in this kind of scenario um, in, in a, to help build that psychological safety or to help normalize different power imbalances or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, so, well, you, you use the word modify. So um, I, I use in flow, let me be clear. I mean, I have, I have a host uh, of, of uh, things in my tool bag, so to speak, so, for example, if we're talking about, you know, step one, and uh, particularly when we're talking about fitness for purpose, we're talking about sources of dissatisfaction, those conversations might trigger something. Um, and yes, I may pull something forward and say, well, okay, let's, let's try this. So, as I, as I mentioned, the simple things that I have in this mirror board that I just wanted you guys to be able to see off to the off to the right those are some of the basic activities that that we can do but i have other content that i can easily bring in if if we needed to have that conversation um, and we may we may hit the pause button right so if we're talking about sources of dissatisfaction for example and that does trigger something and i realize all right now we're in a place of of you know, lack of psychological safety or, or in a sensitive area, or clearly this has got people frustrated, um, we may hit the pause button for now and come back and revisit that in a completely different way. Um, so again, I don't, I don't have a, a scripted way of doing that, but when those things emerge, I'll either go grab something else from another mural board or some other content and, and inject it in, um, or we'll, you know, we'll adjust or pivot if needed. Nice. Thank you so much. Can I ask a, just a quick logistical question? Cause my brain is starting to churn. Um, you, you were mentioning, and that's what I've ex been experiencing as well, that a, a lot of companies in, in the, these days of COVID and even outside, uh, just super busy and can't, you know, can't sign up to a two day class. So yeah. I was thinking about the potentiality of breaking it up into each step being a workshop and doing them in order over time. And with that kind of trying to estimate time boxes for the steps. And I'm, and I know the context matters, but I was thinking like high level, are you seeing kind of like maximum maybe two hours per step and depending mm -hmm. on the step, maybe they only need a half an hour, but two yeah. is probably the max, or I just want to make sure I'm allowing enough time. Yes. So, so again, that's, that's the, what I, what I refer to as doing these as micro workshops. Um, and we may do one at a time, right? Step one we'll do today. If we can come back tomorrow or, or whatever that looks like. Right. So I will work with them to, to, to figure out the right way to spread this out. Um, in my experience, um, in the virtual Zoom world, um, anything less than two hours is just not enough to have any meaningful conversation with this stuff. Um, so I always advocate for a two hour time box for these things at a minimum, not a maximum. Um, because it, it, we're either going from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom and, and, and it's just this compression problem. Um, and depending again on the nature of the dialogue of the teams, you know, that, that takes time as well. So I, I try to get more time rather than less time. Um, again, knowing that that time is precious. So I'll, I'll usually try to do these in two hour increments, uh, if possible. I find that anything less than that becomes really challenging to, to really get deep into. But if we need to do that, we can do that and we just continue to iterate. 
Yeah, thank you. That's super helpful. Yeah. Richard. I have a question, Richard. Sure. Uh, okay, so I'm thinking about evolutionary change, right? We, when in Kanban, we talk about small incremental changes, evolution. They obviously, the system itself that they design and the team designs it, right? We just help guide them to getting there. And, and so we don't give them the answers to, okay, what does this system should be like? They know what they, how they work. So my question is in that it obviously the works, the results of the workshop doesn't have to be perfect. Um, but all, cause sometimes you can get in there and they're not talking. They got like, you know, the glare in their eyes. They're not sure sure what they should say. Um, and so I'm wondering what you think about that. I mean, if it's not, I mean, where do you sort of stop, right? And say, okay, that, yeah. this is it. And yeah. over time, your system will evolve anyway. And they'll, you know, from analyzing it every day, they'll start to see where they need to change it. Or, yeah. So yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah, well, for starters, um, I can almost guarantee it won't be perfect. <laughs> um, and there's, there's beauty in the imperfection, I like to say. So um, it won't be perfect. It, it is a work in progress. Um, it's a core, core principles of Kanban are that we're going to experiment and we're going to uh, collaborate and we're going to try things. And we, we, we need to understand that you know, we can't optimize the whole all at once. So it, it absolutely won't be perfect. And, and again, we may need to iterate through some of these. Um, the, the time box question, again, that, that's pervasive, pervasive for everything that we do. Um, and as I always also encourage Scrum teams, um, and I'm guessing many of us have experienced this when you first learn the heuristics of Scrum and, and we're supposed to be spending you know, all this time in sprint planning. Well, there's no way we can spend all that time on sprint planning and, and we try to compress it down into less time. The result is generally not good. So I've always said, you know, the time boxes are there to enable us to, to get as deep into these topics as we can. Um, they're not there to be, you know, a, a jail sentence. So if, if we can accomplish what we need to accomplish in three hours, but we had a four hour time box, well, great. Now we get an hour to go do other things. Um, or if, if we're sensing that we're full, right, my, I, my brain can't take any more. Um, I, as a facilitator, I'm always reading the room and I'm trying to get a feel for the energy of the group. So while my, I may have a big appetite to get through a lot today, I'm certainly going to be paying attention to the, you know, the energy of the group. And if we need to stop, we'll stop and we'll reconvene and we'll pick up uh, where we left off at some future point. So you absolutely, as a facilitator, we always need to be, be mindful of that and not overload people and, and allow them to have space to consume this and, and process it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they're uh, great, great questions. <laughs> Great questions and engagement. And I'm, this is, I don't want to, it's 7.30 if you need to drop. Um, I, I was going to say, we're, we're right we're right at the end uh, of the time box. And, and thank you. I just, if I can make a final statement. So I absolutely appreciate all the feedback. Um, you know, I learn from others. And so if you have thoughts, uh, if you've tried the, this before, if you've tried other things before, uh, please share. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to chat. Some people have put some comments in chat that, that you have ideas. I would love to chat with you about your ideas. Um, and I want people to, to try this stuff and, and see how well it works. So thank yeah, you. I have a couple of, yeah, Richard, I have a couple of workshops coming up. So I would love to use this and tell you, give the audience and the community feedback. Happy to discuss. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping I can get this as a template or something that I could actually, you know, just a yeah, put on my on my mirror on your board so to use. How how do should I maybe reach out to you in LinkedIn to maybe um, to discuss yeah, that? Definitely feel free to, to connect with me on LinkedIn. I see that Marie posted a link for um crowdsource. I will I'll work with Marie and Nancy on on how best for me to share out the PDF okay. of this and and template. Um but 
by all means, anybody can connect with me on LinkedIn and we can go from there as well. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Great questions. I encourage you guys to um, you know, copy that FAQ because we're going to copy the links to uh, any information that we have from this meetup. Yeah. We'll yeah. also probably send out something to the yeah. group that was here. Um, yep. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great. And also um, just a quick promotion. If you are interested in presenting, we're always looking for interesting speakers and new topics. So we're very grateful to Richard for tonight for presenting. It was wonderful, very engaging. And thanks to everybody for attending. Great crowd tonight and great engagement and questions. Well done, Richard. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. I have to say, I thought I was going to be heckled more by a few uh, few individuals out there. So, Thank well, you. if those individuals want to stay on, we'll we'll keep Richard for five more minutes and we can. The the heckle I was period. off my game tonight. I was off my game. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'll stay. I'll stay. We, we only heckle in person, Richard. Come on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's that's true of of some of you, but not not. <laughs> Hilarious. Great to see everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to share it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very Good much. Good to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.